Are you confused about the rulers and kingdoms of medieval India because they feel too complicated to you? If you are looking for a detailed overview regarding medieval India, then watch this video completely to get an overview and some basic ideas regarding medieval Indian history. Now let us have a look at the topics we are going to discuss today. Mainly in medieval India, during the its initial phase, you can actually see the North Indian kingdoms and then you can see the kingdoms of the Deccan. Then comes the Delhi Sultanate. Then there is the Vijayanagara Empire. Then we are going to discuss about Bhakti and other social religious movements like the Sufi movement. And then we will look at the rule of the Mughals. Then at last, to conclude, we will look at the arrival of Europeans such as the Dutch, the Danese, the Portuguese, the French and the British. Now, medieval India is generally believed to have roughly lasted from the fall of the Gupta Empire in 6th century CE up to the beginning of early modern period in 1526 with the establishment of Mughal Empire. Okay? And you have to understand that the early medieval and late medieval eras make up the entire medieval period and roughly the 8th to 18th century AD. The 8th to 18th century AD is the period of medieval Indian history. And also the tri-party struggles between kingdoms like Rashtrakutas, Pallas and Gujara, Pratiharas, they, it marks the beginning of the medieval era. And after the death of Shashanka, the king of Gaur, the king of Gaur, and Hashwardhan's great arrival around uh, 637 CE, there was a century of anarchy and confusion in Bengal. This situation is described by Sanskrit phrase Matsyanyaya. That is Matsyanyaya. What does Matsyanyaya mean? Matsyanyaya means fresh justice. That is a situation in which big fish prey on the smaller ones. During this time, the neighboring kingdom of Assam attacked the kingdom of Bengal area and uh, it was taking advantage of the anarchy. And at this point, all the smaller kingdoms came together and the nobles of the region elected one ruler to fill the vacuum and protect all these lands. Now, particularly when studying uh, history for civil service, the issue of modern Indian history are directly tied to heritage and culture. The following topics are very crucial to learn about Indian medieval history. Now, the first topic of discussion would be about the North Indian kingdoms and the most important of being them being the Rajput. There are numerous theories, including the Agnikola theory, the tribal origin theory, the foreign origin theory, the Kshatriya origin theory, and the mixed origin theory that explain their origins. And also, you have to understand that Rajputs were the people who lived in early medieval era and they thrived during the period 647 to 1200 AD. And from Harsha's demise until 12th century, the Rajput dynasties largely controlled India's coast. Now, there were many clans uh, that formed the Rajput kingdom. And actually, it was like the Rajput kingdom was formed by the union of many small clans. And there were actually 36 such clans. And now let us look at some significant clans. First one would be the Pallas of Bengal, then the Chauhans of Delhi and Ajmer, the Rathors of Kannauj, the Guhilas of Sisodias of Mewar, the Chandelas of Bundelkhand, the Paramaras of Malwa, the Senas of Bengal, and the Solankis of Gujarat. Now, actually the Rajput clan, they were known for their valor, chivalry, and ma martial powers. And uh, actually, the Rajputs fiercely defended their territories against foreign invasions. Their Rajputana region, comprising present-day Rajasthan, became a very stronghold. And the Rajputs actually left a legacy in art, art, architecture, and also culture, with famous forts like Chitogar and Jaipur's palaces showcasing their. You can actually go to these places, the Chitogar and. Jaipur palaces and it actually showcases their art, uh, architectural, you know, the that beauty and their legacy. Their crowd of honor 
that is the Rajputana chivalry and the resistance to external powers are enduring aspects of Indian medieval history. Now you can see some pictures over here which are actually related to the Rajput kingdom. Now you must look at the Deccan kingdom or the kingdoms of the Deccan. Now the term Deccan, it actually signifies the southern parts or the southern regions of India. And uh, these regions, the Deccan or the Dakshinapada regions, they indicate the southern regions of India. And you have to understand that the rivers Narmada and Tapi and the mountains Vindhya and Satpura and some deep forests, they actually divide Deccan from North India. So these two are the important rivers and these two are the important mountains and there are forests that actually divide the Deccan from Northern India. And also uh, in Deccan during medieval India, it was the Chalukyas and Rashtrakutas that actually rose to prominence. They were the ones who controlled that part of India. And also Delhi Sultanates like the Khilji and the Tughlaqs, they actually began expanding their territories to southern period, uh, sorry, to the southern regions during this period. Actually, the Delhi Sultanate was a very powerful kingdom and they ruled most of northern India, but they began expanding to south India during this medieval India period. After that, oh, let us look at the Delhi Sultanate. Now, what you have to understand about the Delhi Sultanate was that it was a 320-year-long Islamic dominion that ruled over a sizable portion of the Indian subcontinent from Delhi. 320-year-long rule. Okay? And uh, the Delhi Sultanate was ruled by five different dynasties in succession. Let us look at them. The Mamluk, the Khalji, the Tughlaq, the Sayyid, and the Lodi. So these were five dynasties and they ruled one after another in this order in the Delhi Sultanate period. Now, the Delhi Sultanate, it actually included vast areas in present-day Bangladesh, Pakistan, India and certain southern Nepalese regions. With the founding of the Delhi Sultanate, a new governing in, in India a new, a new kind of governance, that is a governing type of style, a governing elite, you can say, in India was created. A new administrative framework was introduced by this new class and the Sultan oversaw the government during the Sultanate era with the assistance of number of nobles. Now, along with uh, the Sultan, actually, along with, also with the Sultan, there was an office the Sultan's office and also there were numerous other offices. The uh, Let me just write it down for you. The Majlis I Khilakal The Majlis I Khabat I Khabat uh, Now this this term, what does this term signify? This term actually signifies a council of ministers. A council of ministers that was actually meant to support the Sultan. Because the Sultan had, was the head of the state and uh, he was the supreme. But the Sultan also had many number of ministers, a separate office and a council of ministers to actually assist him for the governance. That is why the spirit, it is also embarked as a new governing elite because it was more superior than the others. And it, in the Indian context, the Sultanate governance is referred to as turku afghan structure and the Sultans saw themselves as Caliphs emissionaries. Now, the first sultan to receive a letter of acknowledgement from the caliph was Iltumish. Just It is a fact and it is uh, important to know that he was, who was the first sultan to receive a letter of acknowledgement from the caliph, it was Iltumish. Now, you, another point to be remembered is that when the Delhi Sultanate existed, it was neither a theocratic or a secular state. It was actually based on the ruler, 
whether to be a theocratic or a secular state. Now here are some images of uh, the Delhi Sultanate that is below the tomb and uh, the tomb of a Tughlaq ruler, the Vijayanagara Empire. Now, when you're discussing about the Vijayanagara Empire, you have to understand that the, by the decline of the Sultanate period, numerous other Deccan provinces rose to power, with the Multan and Bengal being the first to declare their independence from Delhi Sultanate. The Vijayanagara Empire lasted from 1336 until 1646. The Vijayanagara city was founded in 1336 AD on the southern banks of Tungabhadra by the Harihara and Bukha. So, so the, uh, Tungabhadra is the river and on its banks, on its southern bank in 1336 uh, AD, the Vijayanagara city was founded by Harihara and Bukha. Now, Hampi was chosen as the nation's capital and they fought for the king Hoysala, King Veerabhallala III. The Vijayanagara Empire, like any other empire, it was made up of many kingdoms and actually they all fought for the same reason and the same cause and they fought for Hoysala King Veerabhallala III. Now there were four important dynasties that actually ruled the Vijayanagara Empire and they were Sangama, Saluva, Tuluva and Aravida. Just note down these names and these are the four important dynasties that ruled the Vijayanagara Empire. And uh, you have to understand that uh, an em in an empire, it is made up of actually many dynasties and the most prominent ones get to rule the kingdom. And uh, we have got all of these information about the Vijayanagara Empire from certain literary sources and they are Vishwanatha Stanapati's Rayavajakam and Robert Sewell's The Forgotten History of Vijayanagara Empire. Now, Kannada and Telugu literature that was read in the Vijayanagara court such as Manusharitam, Salavabhyudayam, uh, they all actually provide the genealogical, political and the social information during the time period of the Vijayanagara Empire. Now, the primary source of binding, the family history of the Sangama dynasty is the Bitragunta inscription. Bitragunta inscription. So, what do we get from the Bitragunta ins uh, inscription? We get the primary source. It, it was a primary source for building the family history of the dynasty. Now, Srira, what is the uh, relevance of Sri Rangam copper plates of Devaraya 2? The accomplishments and ancestry of the Vijayanagara kings are documented in them. Okay? So, the uh, you have to note that the accomplishments and the ancestry of Vijayanagara kings are document, documented in the Sri Rangam copper plates of Devaraya 2. Now, there existed many Devaraya period copper plate inscriptions. So, till date we have found so many copper plate inscriptions that believe that belong to the Krishna Devaraya period. And also the Vijayanagara monarch's cultural accomplishments are documented by the ruins at Hampi and other Vijayanagara monuments. And these are the important facts you must remember about Vijayanagara Empire. Now, when we talk about Bhakti and other cultural, re cultural and religious movements, what you have to understand is that the word Bhakti referred to devotion and uh, that the Bhakti movement as a movement placed a strong emphasis on devotion and love that a follower of a personal deity has that has for that follower. Between 7th and 10th century CE, this trend began in South India, primarily in the poems of Alvars, primarily in the poems of Alvars and Nayanars. And uh, in the poems of Alvas and Nainas, they were written with Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva in mind. Uh, Alvas wrote about Lord Vishnu and Nainas wrote about, uh, wrote about Lord Shiva. And the Bhagavata Purana, 
a Sanskrit work from 10th century, is where bhakti first appeared in North in India. It began spread over uh, spreading over the East and North India in 15th century and peaked between 15th and 17th centuries. Now you have to understand the, uh, the reasons why such a movement came into pro, uh, existence. It would be the expansion of Islam was one reason and the arrival and growth of influential reformers was another uh, reason. The Sufi sect influence also contributed and growing Vaishnavism and Shai Shaivism ideology influence was also there. And also it was in opposition to the sinister customs that had crept into Hinduism. Now moving on, we'll have to discuss about the Mughals. Here are some pictures of the Bhakti movement. Now the Mughals. Now the Mughals belong to a branch of Turks known as Chagatai, which bears the name of Gengi Genghis Khan's second son. And you have to understand that the Mughal era can be divided into the early Mughals and the late Mughals mainly because they are of two different category of rulers that the early Mughals they were stronger they were stronger and they were actually more prominent they were dominant actually they were emphasized more uh, administrative reforms and they were brilliant during their rule and they had the upper hand when they ruled over the areas during the Mughal period. But the late Mughals, they can actually be seen more as a puppet to their ministers and they lost most of their uh, rule and their importance when the Europeans came into, came into the picture. So the early Mughals, some of the rulers are Babur, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. Uh, after Aurangzeb, you can see all the rulers, they belonged to the Mughal Empire, but they were just a puppet in the in the hands of their ministers and the Britishers or the French rulers, mostly the Europeans. And uh, till the time of Aurangzeb, you can see that all the rulers were very fierce and they were very strong. Now, some of the late Mughal rulers are Bahadur Shah Jahandar Shah, Karokasiya, Rafi Uddalat, Raf, um, and also Rafi Uldarjit, Rafi Uddalat, Muhammad Ibrahim, and the uh, Muhammad Shah, Muh Ahmad Shah, Bahadur, Alam Giz the second, Shah Jahan third, Shah Alam second, Akbar Shah second, Bahadur Shah second. All of these were the most important rulers of the, or all of the rulers of the late Mughal period. Now here is a picture of Babur, Akbar and Jahangir and they belonged to the early Mughals. They were very strong in their rule and they had a beautiful period during the Mughal era. Now the social and economic life under Mughals. So when we discuss about the Mughals, there, uh, we can also discuss their social and economic life that the people used to have. The majority of accounts uh, that talk about the Mughals, speak about India's wealth and prosperity as well as the opulent lifestyle of the nobility. Foreigners have also written reports describing the plight of common people like farmers and artisans and their poverty and suffering. So, even the nobility, even though the noble people had an opulent lifestyle, uh, you can also see certain pictures like the plight of the common people and there were suffering and there were instances of poverty. All of this also can be seen during the Mughal period. Now, generally, uh, the agriculture, according to one estimate, India had a population of uh, roughly 125 million at the start of the 17th century and also that new, there were different crops. Now, uh, some of the crops include barley, gram, legumes, rice and wheat. So, these are mainly the most important crops that were grown during that time. And commercial crops like indigo, cotton, sugarcane and oil seeds were also grown during the time of Mughal period. Now, we look at the arrival of the Europeans. Now, there were a different sect of Europeans that came 
the first to arrive were the Portuguese and the second who came, the sect of Europeans came were the Dutch and then Danish people came and then the French arrived and the last to arrive were the Europe, uh, were the Britishers. The last sect of people who arrived from the Europe were the Britishers, but you can see later on in history that they were the ones who rose to prominence and ruled India for almost a long period of time. So while talking about the sect of Europeans, the first who came to India were the Portuguese. The first Europeans to arrive in India were the Portuguese and the first person to set foot on Indian ground was Vasco da Gama. And he found a new sea passage from Europe to India about the year 1498 CE. And uh, he arrived in Calicut after sailing around Africa via the Cape of Good Hope. This day in history for May 20 has further information on Vasco da Gama's arrival in Calicut. Now, uh, the Hindu monarch of Calicut, the Zamorin or the Samudiri, welcomed him and the next year he returned to Portugal with a cargo of Indian goods that had a market value of 60 times what was the mission cost. A second Portuguese explorer, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, arrived in India in 1500 CE, while Vasco da Gama conducted a second journey around 1502 CE. The Portuguese founded trading outposts in Cananor, Cochin, and Calicut. So these are their trade ports, trading outposts. So you must do well to remember it. And uh, Alfonso de Albuquerque assumed the position of governor of Portuguese colonies in India about the year 1509 CE. And after the same time, he captured Goa from the monarch of Bijapur under the rule of Sikandar Lodi, making Goa the center of Portuguese settlements in India. From Hormos and Gulf in Persian Gulf to Malacca in Malaya, and the Spice Islands in Indonesia, the Portuguese cemented their dominance over the whole Asian coast. So it was from Hormos in Persian Gulf to Malacca in Malaya and the Spice Islands in Indonesia that the Portuguese exerted their dominance. And uh, the Portuguese were India's dominant naval force at the time of Alphonse Albuquerque's demise. With the exception of Daman, Diu, and Goa, the Portuguese lost all of their gained possessions in India by the end of 16th century as their influence in the country waned. Now, now Dutch were the second to arrive in India. Uh, and in 1602 CE, uh, this is a Dutch name, the Viringi Oost Indische Campaign. VOC, which later came to be known as, it was actually the Dutch East India Company. It was actually founded. And the first factory established by the Dutch was in Masuli Patanam, Andhra, along with Surat, Braj, Kambay, and Ahmedabad in Gujarat in West India, Kuchin in Kerala, Chinsara in Bengal, Patna in Bihar, and Agra in Uttar Pradesh. All these were their commercial terminals. And their primary location in India was Pulikat in Tamil Nadu, which was later uh, superseded by Nagapattanam. They gained the support of Portuguese and they were the most powerful in European trade with East in the 17th century. Now you have to also understand the Portuguese were the ones who dropped off the Indonesian islands. Uh, actually, the Dutch, which gained prominence in India soon after that, they drew the Portuguese uh, in the before we actually saw that it was Portuguese who had the dominance in the Indonesian islands. But the Dutch seemed to have drove the Portuguese out of the Indonesian islands and the Malay Straits. And they starved the English attempts to settle there in around 1623. But unfortunately, the Dutch also uh, used their rule over the period of time. And then in between this time, there came... 
The Danes established an East India Company in C 1616 CE. They formed settlements at Trankabar and Tamil Nadu in 1620 CE and at Serampur, Bengal in 1676 CE. Now you have to understand that their headquarters was at Serampur. Uh, but they could not actually strengthen themselves in India and they had to sell all their set settlements in India to the British in the year 1845. Now, French in India, uh, Colbert, a minister from Louis XIV, uh, formed the French East India Company, the French East India Company, somewhere about 1664 CE. Uh, Francis Caron established the first factory in Surat in about 1668 CE. Now, Marakara built a factory in Masuri Patanam in 1669 CE and Frank Hoys Martin founded Pondicherry, which was a very important French settlement. Uh, they called it the Fort Louis about 1673 CE and he later served as its first governor. Pondicherry eventually became the center of the French position in India. And Shaista Khan, the governor, sold Chandranagur, which lies close to Calcutta, to the French sometime about 1690 CE. And French factories uh, were established in Balasur, Mahi, Kwasim, Bazar, and Karakal around 1642 CE, when Joseph Francis Duplay arrived as the French governor of India. The Anglo French battle began leading to the infamous Carnatic War. The Anglo-French battle were very important. And what do they signify? It signifies French on one side fighting the Britishers And uh, these wars are actually called the Anglo-French Wars fought on the soil of India. And one such uh, war is the Carnatic War. Now moving forward to the British rule in India. Around 1599 CE, the year 1599, very important to remember that, a group of traders known as the Merchant Adventurers established the English Association or company to trade with the East, which later came to be known as, for all might be knowing, the English East India Company. And on December 31st, 16, uh, 1600 CE, Queen Elizabeth granted the East India Corporation a royal charter and the exclusive right to trade in the East. This corporation became to be known as East India Company or the English East India Company. Captain William Hawkins, he actually travelled to the court of Mughal Emperor Jahangir in the year 1609 CE to request permission to set up an English trading port in Surat. Uh, but actually the Portuguese had their own ports there and they were pressuring the emperor and the emperor had to actually reject it. But later Jahangir gave East India Company permission to build a factory in Surat in the year 1612 CE. Sir Thomas Root, who served as James I of England's ambassador to the Mughal court about 1615 CE, who was successful in persuading an imperial farmer to engage in trade and set up factories throughout India. And actually, very quickly, the British actually they conquered most of the uh, places. Actually, it was very you can see that in around 1619 CE itself, they had constructed their factories in Agra, in Ahmedabad, Baroda and Broch. And uh, they were getting more and more territories under their control. And at Masuli Patanam, the English established their first factory in South. Uh, Surat, their first factory and Masuli Patanam, the English established their first factory in South. And you have to know that uh, there was a temporary kind of say, uh, there was a temporary factory at Masulia Patanam in 1611, 
but the first permanent british factory was established at surat in 1630 and it was a mark of the arrival of europeans that india saw a completely different period in history the journey in indian history that falls between the arrival of europeans and 1947 when india attained independence falls under the modern indian history so this is an overview about the medieval indian history the kingdoms and uh, the movements involved and uh, the other details just a basic overview about medieval indian history you can actually go and refer to the complete medieval indian notes in our website which is available for free please go check out for the complete notes of medieval india thank you